Kwai, Galaswigo Pan, hello and welcome. And we mentioned this in the beautiful Wulastagui language, the language of the land that sustains us. Thank you to everybody for joining us here today at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design. And we are situated next to the Wulastuk River, along which live uh, Wulastaguiwik, the people of the beautiful and bountiful river. So today's guest lecture seven, and joining us we have Thaddeus Holonia, and we're very excited about that. Welcome, Thaddeus. Jean Rooney is my name. Uh, I go by the pronoun she, and I'm the coordinator of Advanced Studio Practice. And we are organizing the Advanced Studio Practice program, this guest lecture uh, series. A reminder before we begin that this session is being recorded and so by staying and participating you are agreeing to be recorded. Please be mindful just as you can see and hear others that you yourself are being seen and heard. We ask everybody to turn their microphone on mute and if you have problems with glitching or bandwidth that maybe you turn your own video off and that should actually help. Um, and lastly, the opinions given are strictly those of the speaker and do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design, the Atlantic Center for Creativity, or the Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation. So we will all be patient and understanding with each other as we navigate this technology and delivery mode. And to officially begin, I'll go over and ask Jody to do the land acknowledgement. Thank you, Jean. This land that we live and work on is unceded and unsurrendered territory. I recognize that the peace and friendship treaties were signed between 1725 and 1779 by the Elnu, the Wolastigwiwik, the Passamaquoddy First Nations, and the British. These peace and friendship treaties were among the earliest treaties to be made between indigenous nations and Western nations. Since Confederation, the Canadian government has made efforts to erase and assimilate First Nations with the Residential Schools Act and the Indian Act. However, the resilience of Indigenous peoples has pulled through these vile times and continues to influence Canada's social, cultural, and environmental perspective today. Thank you, Jody. And now we'll go over to Ben, and Ben will tell us about the guest lecture series. Thank you, Jean. This guest lecture series is sponsored and made possible by the Sheila Hugh Mackay Foundation. It is organized by the Advanced Studio Practice Program at the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design in partnership with the Atlantic Center for Creativity. The purpose of the guest lecture series is to model successful contemporary practice to our students and to inform, inspire, and ignite art and design dialogue and engagement in the greater public community. The guest lecture series provides this by giving a platform for presentation creating time for dialogue, and by celebrating the creative and cultural riches that we hold in Atlantic Canada. Thank you very much, Ben. And now to tell us about the Atlantic Center for Creativity, the ACC, our partner, we'll go over to Lee. Thanks, Jean. The Atlantic Center for Creativity, it, it's an initiative that promotes creativity across disciplines. It has three main goals, to promote research and programming in the area of creativity and innovation, and to offer events such as symposia, conferences, and workshops on a yearly basis for sharing ideas and information, and to build partnerships in the area of creativity and innovation on a local, regional, and national basis. Um, you, you can get more information about the uh, organization by visiting their website at AtlanticCenterForCreativity.com and you'll find there also their new online journal, Creativity Matters. Jean? Thank you, Lee. Um, it's quite important that we remember as artists, this is a way that we can actually band together during the pandemic. So we can continue to share stories, um, listening to hear each other's practices, how we survive and we renew and we can continue to thrive during these times. So for all of those reasons, uh, you really should go check out the Atlantic Center for Creativity. Now we'll go over to Audrey uh, for our guest speaker introduction. Today's speaker is Thaddeus Holonia, and his talk is entitled A Love Affair with Looking. Thaddeus Holonia is a visual artist, 
letterpress printer, publisher, and professor emeritus after 41 years at Mount Allison University in the Department of Fine Arts. Polonia is a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a Fulbright Fellow, and an elected member of the RCA, Royal Canadian Academy of Arts. Over to Thaddeus. Uh, kind of touchstone elements of, of working in a visual medium. This is a tombstone that I came across in a graveyard in Halifax. And uh, upon quick examination, you can see that it's a headless crucifix, crucified figure with a profile that's very much iconic uh, in the Christian way. Um, so the two of them kind of resonate in a crazy way. And um, in a matter of probably 15 minutes, the sun had moved and so the shadow had become nothing in relationship to the, the uh, dialogue that was created from the shadow and the, and the crucified figure, um, headless crucified figure. So I, I just think that if we're working in the medium of photography, the two elements that work around my work are time and light. And, and of course that has to be piled into the subject of, of whatever I'd be photographing. So um, oh yeah, there we go. Uh, so another kind of a conceptual idea is things referring to things that are timely and of, of the age. And this is entitled classical texting. And uh, so, I mean, I don't have to, I don't have to explain every photograph. I hope I won't, but uh, little anecdotal things like the crucified uh, shadow and, and this shadow, um, you know, I have a sense of humor about life and I try to find it within my work at times. Uh, my daily routine is, is I live in the country and I take my dogs, my dog now, I only have one at the moment, uh, out for a walk in the mornings and I, we have a stable with horses and I kind of travel through that. And uh, so I'm, I'm always kind of taking snippets of a life that catch my eye. If, if you're on Facebook with me, you, you get a healthy dose of, of my, my world every day. Um, this is uh, <laughs> this is on the road from uh, Sackville to Jollicure, which is about 15 miles uh, in the country. And uh, I made this photograph through the windscreen of my car because I had to stop because there was ducks and other fowl on parade. And uh, I think life is to be celebrated and um, you always have to be ready to, to engage with whatever's going on uh, around you. This, this, these two photographs kind of uh, sum up a sad side of life. Uh, this is the brutalist church uh, in Moncton which I photographed uh, a number of times with a view camera. And uh, I mean, that, that was like spectacular. Uh, this is last week, uh, not so spectacular. <laughs> um, so I, I'm always reminded about uh, permanence and change and how everything is in a state of flux and how we, we need to embrace the moment. And as artists, we need to comment on the moment. And um, so, yeah, I, I like to think that I'm always engaged in that dialogue. And now that I'm not teaching, I find myself far more involved in the local, especially, um, now during pandemic times. So October, I'm gonna run through a series of photographs and essentially I make a photograph every morning off my back deck. 
And this is up to now what October looked like. So there's a month's look worth of looking. This was this morning. Um, I made a body of work that was called the Jolly Grapon 19 something or other to 19 something or other. It's in the collection of the Beaverbrook Art Gallery. And when they do reopen, it may still be up in the, uh, in the New Brunswick or the Canadian galleries as you, as you go in there. Um, it was a great body of work and I made it essentially in conversations with my kids about the fact that you don't have to travel very far to make a body of work. And so I set up a tripod on my back deck and I photographed um, the landscape over a few years in a similar manner to what I just showed you. And um, created a body of work. Uh, and what I'm going to try to share with you with the rest of my talk here today is I'm very much dedicated to working with view cameras and uh, I'm not going to get into a whole technical spiel here about view cameras, but essentially cameras that use a film negative that's of a variety of sizes. And I like the process because uh, I view the image on a ground glass, which gives me a direct relationship to what it is I'm going to have in the print. And except for a very few situations, I've remained loyal to contact printing, and that is making a print the same size as the negative that uh, the camera produced. And so my cameras of choice over the years have been the Gundlach Manhattan camera, where I used an eight by 20 inch negative, uh, the Wisner Technical, the seven by 17, four by 10 and five, four by five inch negatives. And then the Chamonix, uh, which is a 10 by 12, seven by 11 and eight by 10 inch format camera. And in some cases, those are separate cameras. And in the case of the Chamonix camera, it's a camera that has three different film backs and each one of them allows me to change uh, format of film. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions as we go along here, but uh, so feel free, as I said earlier, to, to comment or to ask a question. And if anyone um, want to ask, they can type them into Tadius and we, we can relay them. So yeah, you can turn your microphones off mute if you need to do that. Thanks. Okay. Do I do share screen to get on? Oops. No, don't do that. What do I do to get vision? <laughs> Peter Thomas right. just joined us there. Sorry, Tadius, go ahead. No, oh, no, no, it's all good. Um, so this is a seven by 17 inch format view camera, a portrait of that Karen Steneford made of me one day. It's the only one I could find on short notice. 
So all the cameras that I use are essentially tripod based wooden objects with a lens on the front, glass on the back, attached bellows. And uh, so it's a process that requires some amount of setting up. It's not instantaneous. And I'll go through, uh, oh yeah, so this is a portrait I made at the Tides Institute uh, and Museum of Art in Eastport, Maine, where I've had a close association for over a decade. And uh, with my friend, John LaRue, we produced a book called Eastport on a commission. And uh, the, the view camera that, that I used, the, the larger format, 717, eight by 20, were originally made to do portraits of people at banquets. And so whenever the occasion arises that there's a group of people that I can photograph, uh, I always do that because I feel like I can honor what the camera was originally designed for. And you can kind of see me right in the center. There's a reflection in the door, which is great. That shows the photographer and, and his camera. Um, so very early on, I did a project called headlighting and uh, I only show this because I did that project on paper negatives. I couldn't afford film at the time. I was just out of university. And so I used eight by 20 inch sheets of photographic paper and I exposed those and the exposures are usually from about, oh, a couple of seconds to four or five seconds. And there was no shutter. I just used a lens cap. And I produced a body of work that was called headlighting. So there's the negative and there's your positive. And uh, I traveled all over the place. Uh, I've, it was kind of a participatory event where I would stop people who I didn't know but had interesting cars and uh, some people match their cars. <laughs> this is, uh, I'm just in the process of organizing this into a book after many decades. So you can keep your ears open. Um, I work on, uh, towards books. I like the process. I collaborate with friends who are writers and who have similar interests. And so the book is kind of a democratic way to, to offer up bodies of work that have a little more permanence than having an exhibition. I, I always felt exhibitions are kind of transient. Few people see them and then they're gone. So working towards a book that encapsulates an, uh, of an idea and, and is matched with some literary text is, is a lot of, there's a lot of satisfaction in that. So architecture, I thought rather than landscape, I would choose architecture today as, as the theme uh, and mostly a local theme, although there is a little bit of Maine towards the end. Um, I build on, on experiences. And so Sackville, where I've lived for the last 41 years or so, I, I have photographed there very extensively as I have the Tantramar Marshes. Um, I don't know, Gene, where there's a, the library at your school or if there is one. Yeah. I would have some of my books. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. So Dykelands is a book that um, would have a lot of those images. Um, and so, yeah, I, a lot of this architecture work's never been shown. It just, it kind of exists as a, as a social and historical document of, of the place. Um,
Uh, John LaRue and I also did a book on the architecture of um, Mount Allison University uh, published by Gasparo Press. Uh, I'm trying to remember the title of it. <clears throat> can't remember. But it, it came at a time when the new fine arts building was being built and there was a bit of controversy about knocking down an old old stone building and uh, putting up a new building. And so I kind of had the idea that people didn't realize that Mount Allison, in fact, had been a wooden campus for a long, long time. And in fact, the only building that's remaining from that historic time is this house in the center. And it became a, a pretty much a stone campus. Uh, speaking of stone. <laughs> so along the way, things happen that are, are a lot of fun. And this is a building that was on campus, Palmer Hall. And one day I was doing my rounds and came across this image where <clears throat> the stones had been neatly numbered and lettered. And I made this this view camera photograph and uh, it was a building that the stone was all removed the, the fixed some architectural element of leaking or something and then they put all the stones back up uh, so this kind of relates to the earlier images that I showed sort of like the ducks on parade A little harsher reality is, is this image of a church in Sackville. Different kind of progress. I'm going too fast or too slow, let me know. I, I question that amazingly enough, I get asked just about every time I give a talk is, what's your favorite time to photograph? And uh, I try not to be dismissive when I say any time because it's not about catching the light of a particular morning light or evening light. I think it has much more to do with the subject that you're confronted with and what it is that you're, you're trying to emotionally evoke from that subject. So I'm just kind of always at the ready to engage in something and quite often I'll make a notation of something that interests me in my travels, but does not fulfill the idea of the lighting or the, the, the time of the year. Uh, some things are better photographed in winter, fall, summer, whatever. This is an image that drove me crazy for about 20 years. Uh, this is Fort Beausejour, which is about a 10 minute drive from, from my house. The Wisdom of Parks Canada placed this Atco bathroom trailer in front of this beautiful <laughs> architectural reproduction in front of windows that looked out onto the Bay of Fundy. Uh, 
I don't know what occurred that finally someone came to the realization that it, it made a great ironic photograph, but it served nothing to do with Fort Beausejour and its historic preservation. <laughs> I'm not giving you locations or titles of any of these works as they normally would just basically be titled by the year and uh, the place. But if anyone was interested, they could ask that question. Adios, there was one question that came in um, earlier on in relation to place and location. So Cathy Browning had wanted to know um, the, the, your your space of land where you created those photos uh, was that uh, is your property where Gordon Monaghan created his Aeolian harp. Aeolian. Aeolian. Thank that you. That is exactly where I am. There you go. So she's on, on it. The edge of the property. Yes. Hawkeye, Kathy. I had thought too, as I'm looking at these uh, wonderful works as they come through, and I, I'm feeling like the uh, like their portals and spaces of contemplation, but also struck with the shelter that there's symmetry in the work, but then many of them are showing these spaces of uh, shelter or spaces for us as human animals to be in ways even the graveyard is a shelter under the earth as opposed to over the earth and I'm just wondering was that intentional or is there significance to that? If you saw it there's great significance in that. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, I don't like to make shit up about what I'm doing. I, this is an accumulation of, of my life's experience. And um, hopefully there's a thread of humanity that runs through it that engages and enlightens people in, in a new way or in the same way, but from a different perspective, like this classical vernacular architecture of the Tentramar Marsh Barn, um, which at one time dotted the, the largest hayfield in Canada. Uh, I think when I first moved to Sackville, I believe there was close to 300 barns on the Tantramar, which were essentially a functional building that was designed to accommodate a hay wagon that would drive through it and the hay would be unloaded. Uh, once the necessity of hay that was square baled began to wane and the use of hay began to wane, the barns began to be neglected or abandoned. And at last count, uh, there were 13, which uh, that's, time in history, I guess. This was a particular favorite barn of mine. <clears throat> this was on the High Marsh Road between Sackville and, and my house and studio. And this tree had seeded itself in the lee of the wind and had grown up in the shelter uh, of the barn. Uh, years later, I photographed the tree holding the barn up, which was quite anecdotal again. And uh, sadly, someone cut the tree down, the barn fell down. My one interior today. So 
some of you will remember the Radio Canada International Towers on the Tantramar. This was one of the first photographs I made when I moved to Sackville, uh, 1978, I think I made this photograph. And uh, so this was a shortwave service that broadcast all over the world through a network of uh, antennas that were in between these towers. Uh, sadly, that was all dismantled over uh, the course of a year, probably about four or five years ago when the Harper government decided that the shortwave service wasn't really of any value anymore. Uh, I, for the 60th anniversary, which was probably about 10 years ago, I put together an exhibition of landscape photographs that I had made that sh had the towers in them. And uh, I had an exhibition in Sackville and I had an exhibition in Montreal where the RCI Radio Canada International was based. So here's a little run of those. And they're either very, very subtle and distant as in this image. I don't know how well you can see these on your screens, but, uh, or they're close up or they're very, very obscure. Pretty much, I guess all of the work that I've shown you to date is from seven by 17 inch negatives. This is, uh, there was a time when people liked to burn the marsh in the spring and this is fires that were lit in different places and very low movement of air. So the smoke is laying low. It doesn't occur too much anymore, which is a, probably a really good thing. That last image, Thaddeus, I just couldn't help but think of Turner, like the high drama in that. It's like, wow. <laughs> there is some drama. <laughs> yeah. This is the aftermath of drama. This is a pile of lime that was dropped there. And then we had a bunch of very high winds and rain and it sculpted that pile into kind of what you see out in Alberta in, in, in the landscape there in the coolies. That's uh, the towers are back there somewhere. Some of my photo projects take a considerable amount of time to come to a realization of finality. Uh, so this is entitled Rockland Bridge, Upper Dorchester, 1981-2000. So this is a 20 year project. Um, I remember I earlier mentioned time as being one of the critical elements uh, in photography and in my photography practice. So, um, I didn't refer to time as fractions of seconds, which is what normally a photographic image takes. 
Uh, so this time element started off by my um, engagement with the Rockland Bridge, which was a covered bridge that connected Upper Dorchester and Taylor Village. And if you went on the back road between Dorchester and Memram Cook, you would have, uh, if you stopped and went over to the river, you would have seen, seen this structure. Um, my fascination came from seeing the bridge being taken away by a really, really high tide. The bridge had been built around 1910. It was the second longest covered bridge in New Brunswick. So if you think of the, the Heartland covered bridge, it was uh, slightly smaller than that one. Uh, but my fascination was more with the rock filled cribs that were built to hold that bridge up. And I just kind of was in awe with the idea that in the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, people would have engaged in building something that would be largely destroyed by the tides twice a day and by hand and probably through the use of horses would have hauled stone to connect these two communities. And so this is low tide and this is high tide. And over the course of my travels, I would come by this landscape on a near regular basis. And if the lighting conditions and the wind conditions were favorable, I would set up my view camera and make a photograph. And so you can see here movement in the water and the coating of that structure with ice from the ice tide of, from the Bay of Fundy. And over the course of that 20 year period, things began to change. And for me, it was, I didn't really show this work, although I think there are three images in the New Brunswick Art Bank from, from earlier on. So when I would exhibit it, it would more, more of this sort of delivery, um, not in any particular order of photographing that didn't really care. I didn't try to make it into a movie of destruction, but just each image had to hold its own as, a, as an interesting image. And uh, I showed this work in Germany once and and when I was hanging it, people at first didn't realize it was the same place. <laughs> Another local event that I uh, got involved in was uh, when I heard that they were going to build a sable gas pipeline. I thought, wow, that sounds like a really interesting landscape project. And uh, so I, I did have color film and I started it, this project in black and white and then I switched and photographed it in on seven by 17 inch color film. And uh, that's looking into, I think it's about a 30 inch pipe. Can't remember. And it was a 550 kilometer route that stretch from Goldboro, Nova Scotia at the coastline where the gas came ashore from the Sable Gas Reserves, which ended up not being very reserved and uh, ran out much sooner than they thought and ran through New Brunswick and in through Nova Scotia to Maine and then ran to down into the New England market that was very, very, uh, lucrative to sell gas to. These are gilded alders in mud.
uh, I actually asked permission from the Maritime Northeast Pipeline Corporation to go and photograph this project and they turned me down and said that I wasn't allowed to photograph it. Did they say why? Uh, so, oh, I have no idea. I think they were just kind of paranoid. Uh, what I, they did tell me I could do was be part of the media that would go out once in a while to different locations and photograph or they would have these media events at different locations. And I went to one in Amherst very early on and they, they were showing off what was gonna happen and the location. And so I was talking to one of the engineers and he showed me this 11 by 17 inch piece of paper that had a map of the local area of that the pipeline would pass through and had the roads and river courses and whatnot. So I asked him, do you have one of these for every location? He said, oh yeah, that's, I asked him if I could have a copy of it and he, sure. So he printed me out a copy and I spiral bound it into a map book. And then I just went and bought myself a safety vest. And then I went everywhere and people just thought I was part of the pipeline. That's <laughs> crazy. genius. <laughs> yeah. So don't ever take no as an answer. Okay, uh, Maine. I have this love affair with Maine that's on hold, but I uh, worked on a project. It's kind of interested in what Maine is today as opposed to what Henry David Thoreau was involved in in Maine uh, years ago, obviously. So I. Thaddeus, I don't get that reference. Could you explain it for me? Well, Henry David Thoreau traveled to Maine and was very much involved in the natural history and uh, engaged in, in much of what he did in, in Walden and at Walden Pond. Traveled by canoe and with guides. And uh, so I kind of first started following in the footsteps of Thoreau, but I quickly kind of broadened that idea into just kind of this kind of cultural elements that exist. Um, this, this is a dead crow hanging in a field to scare other birds away. Um, yeah. So it's, it's a different cultural reference to the, the idea of nature. I have a big love affair with trees that seem to appear a lot in, in my bodies of work. This is a few that came out of my Eastport project. And I don't do portraits very often, but I was driving along one day and I saw a woman standing in a, beside her car with an owl on her hand. <laughs> so I got out and I asked her if I could do her portrait and she was amazing. This is a woman who travels to high schools and is with some, I can't remember the name of the organization in outside of, I can't remember whether it's Portland, I think. And uh, she takes, birds of prey that they have that are tamed to these to high schools and public schools and does lectures on the natural world and uh she was amazing as was this owl i did three four by five inch portraits 
of her. And you can imagine she's freestanding with an owl on her hand and the depth of field from a four by five camera is very narrow. And I did three portraits of her in quick succession, which I will show you now. <laughs> Never get tired of those. <laughs> I like the owl has the same expression as she does. <laughs> so this is a four by 10 inch format camera and I'll run through quickly. This was on display at the uh, Beaverbrook for a very short time before they closed. And it's a architectural project I did in Paris over the course of a number of years of the architectural details above the doorways so known as lintels. I must be running out of time here. No, oh, you're good. It's 1247, so you uh, have uh, 10 minutes. Well, we're almost done. There'll be time for questions. <laughs> I don't think I can make this project in Paris today with right after I finished this photographing with a four by 10 inch view camera in Paris, I, on the streets, a whole terrorist thing started to happen. And I'm sure that uh, it would be much more difficult today to set up a view camera in downtown Paris. All right, so here's my COVID project. Um, we've all been hunkering down in our locales and uh, I've been very blessed with having a studio in the country. And so I've been exploring landscapes much closer to home and I've been going into a place called the Sunken Island Bog. And uh, it's, an, it's a landscape that's actually below sea level and it's a big floating mat of uh, moss and uh, I discovered that pitcher plants grow there <clears throat> in great numbers. And uh, I've never seen pitcher plants growing anywhere on the Tantramar before. So I started collecting pitcher plants that were, when they dry up, they kind of break free of their roots and they are just were out there. And when I'd see an interesting one, I would pick it up and bring it back to the studio. And I've done a number of studio works that some of you may be familiar with. Uh, my Ova Ave, which was bird eggs. And I did a project called Ironworks, which was uh, iron blacksmith made objects. And uh, so those are both available as books. And so then I did, I'm working on this as a little book project now. I've never seen these plants before, but they remind me of uh, almost like if I could imagine a fish left a cocoon, this is what it'd be left behind. Yeah, yeah a lot of people have commented on them as being very aquatic fish-like. This is what the plant actually looks like when it's alive. All right, that's it, folks. <laughs> Bravo, well done. Thank you so much, Thaddeus. Um, I'll invite you to unshare your screen if you wish now, so people can- Stop share. There you go, Shop, stop share, yeah. Thank you so much, that was wonderful. There were some comments that came in. People are saying they love the photo so much, love the feeling of the mood in the landscape. 
photos and Lee says it feels like you captured a significant visual commentary of things lost changed and she points to the church demolition that really struck with her thank you can we make comments yep okay first of all Thaddeus thank you so much for the, your beautiful photography it, they're just beautifully rich photographs thank you so much i saw an exhibition of yours that had very large tree trunks at the jane corkin gallery in toronto which was a real juxtaposition in the concrete jungle of toronto but as i was watching your your work i was wondering if when you went out to photo do your photography on location if you um normally did one photograph or if you did several plates and one of the photographs you mentioned you did five or six, the one with the woman with the owl. But I wondered normally how many photographs you take or do you go out intentionally to take a number of photographs or how do you work with that? Uh, I, I usually only photograph an, a subject once unless there's some fleeting moment of change that goes on that I feel could give me an optional idea or investigation. Uh, when I first started using view camera, I had two holders, which would give me four photographs that I could make on any excursion. And uh, so it kind of, I guess the discipline for me is, is seeing the image in my mind's eye, if I could put it that way. And uh, essentially knowing where to put the tripod and then you make the photograph. So it's a, it's a very different kind of process than working with a roll film camera, which has a different, uh, I think, idea behind it. So in the owl photographs, um, it was more the essence of, I had this opportunity to photograph this, this woman holding an owl and the chances of her moving out of focus were probably fairly great. Um, once I, once you view the image, you have to put the film holder in. And so then you don't know what's going to happen because right. she could have moved, but she didn't. And so then I ended up with a little triptych, but yep. uh, yeah, no, one image is usually the discipline that I try to operate from. Thanks for your Thank question, you. Kathy. Um, you mentioned where to put the tripod there, Thaddeus, and Charlene Collette typed in a comment or a question rather, and she says, how do you ensure the repeat ad camera position? Um, in, the, in the photographs of the bridge, I winged it and just would go there and set up my tripod in an area that I thought was fairly close. Uh, the one area that I would want to have exactly right was where I placed the horizon line. Yeah. And the, the um, bridge structure was kind of fairly obvious in the center. And so I have the ground glass gridded out in a kind of random way that I did with a with a pencil, uh, lead pencil. So I kind of have a sense of, of when I have to do it, it's not that hard to do. But I'm not this super anal person that goes and tries to make it exactly perfect because nothing's perfect. <laughs> Chase Claridge had a question. Chase, would you like to voice your question? Or not? No, maybe he can't. Um, I maybe I'll pass it along. He says, um, "Have you always shot in black and white, and is this because it's easier to process for any reason?" No, I photograph in color and black and white. Um, I prefer black and white unless the subject demands that I'm photographing it in color. So, so the pipeline, or I did a project on Sable Island that was all in color years ago. Um, yeah, processing's never been a big issue for me. I, 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 I 
kind of set up to do it. So, yeah. I have a question. Um, you're at the stage of your career and you've lived in an area for a very long time that you have quite the legacy of material around a same area. Um, are you at the point where you are looking at the images you've taken in terms of context of time and um, I guess the the significance of the history of how th the arc of change over that time, because you have some powerful images that tell stories uh, in the elapsed mode, right? Yeah, I think that comes with getting old. I know, uh, I understand. Right? And, and I think that building an a building an art career is not making images uh, in the short term. I think art careers are built in a lifetime, and so. Mm -hmm if you have a, a dedication to something and you pursue it and you pursue it long enough, it becomes your own. And I think great art careers are built on people making whatever it is that they're in love with their own and then demonstrating what that is through their work. It's through, through nothing else but their work. And so, I mean, I don't need to be present to show my work, to have it speak, I hope. Yeah. Right. I mean, it, it's it's really an engagement. And I tell for 41 years, I told students and there's probably a few still listening, perhaps right now, don't squander your opportunity of time because it doesn't come back. <laughs> and if you have the opportunity to be in a place as you do wherever you happen to be studying, then you are in the most gifted and fortunate place you're ever going to be in because you're being handed everything to help you become great, except for the commitment that it takes from yourself. Yeah. yeah. So I learn from every photograph I make every day about myself and about what I want to do to answer your question. I think it builds on itself from, from day one. I'm just wondering if you could talk a bit more about like um, the different locations that you photograph and like because some of them are very like familiar like Sackville you've lived there for your whole life or a long time whatever yeah um, and then like when you go to Paris or to Maine or something like how does yeah. your like feelings toward that place change and like you think you look at different things in different places uh, yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. And um, I guess wherever I happen to go, I, I have a, an interest in going there as an observer of that place. And it doesn't have to do with anything that's maybe refined or figured out until I go there. So I went to Paris four times. I knew I wanted to photograph architecture in the old city and its relationship to today. And, um, and that's very much evident in some of the lintel photographs and in others, it's more pure because I'm, I'm not allowing today to kind of creep in. But, you know, I usually have an idea, a broad stroke idea about going somewhere to photograph. And then I just build on it. And I build on it through the accumulation of seeing something, photographing it, or seeing something and waiting to photograph it at another time. And then those begin to build on themselves and make a relationship. So, so whether it's architecture or landscape or, or whatever, I, I guess portraiture is not a big part of my, my life, but uh, so, um, yeah, it, I mean, it's hard to explain it in detail because it's very intuitive most of the time. But um, if you go to my website, holonia.com, there are a number of portfolios there that you can kind of see how bodies of work grew out of themselves. And, uh, and you have to, I think, be open to change to the idea that you start on one thing and that becomes something, but maybe you discover something else and that becomes something even more important to you. Is that an answer? 
<laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thaddeus. I think it also answered C's question. C Morley said, um, she said, within documentary film, we talk about finding the story in the footage. And she says, I get a sense that you do that this at times and then at other times you have a plan, for instance, the deteriorating bridge, for example. So you've kind of touched on that in, I guess, the last yeah. answer. Yeah. I'm really relieved to hear that, actually. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll gather these things and then we'll just see. Right, I, I really appreciate that. Well, if you don't have the physical, yeah. it's the old woulda, coulda, shoulda, which you hear a lot from students. I hear a lot from everybody, but uh, I'll put it on students today. I've been, I've been, you know, accused of being a bit of a pack rat by my children, but to <laughs> me, it's all got great import for one Absolutely. day. Absolutely. You have to surround yourself with your favorite things. <laughs> If you ever come to my studio, you'll be horrified. <laughs> I have three floors of my favorite things. <laughs> awesome. Well, Thaddeus, I hate to break up the party because you're uh, one great. of our favorite things. And we have looked forward to having this talk. I had actually reached out to Thaddeus last year and he'd agreed to do this pre-COVID. So we're very, very happy and very privileged that you've returned to generously share your practice. And, and to allow us to kind of engage in this love affair of looking. And we certainly have loved looking at your work. So to thank everybody for attending, I wanted to say thank you so much to, you know, people have, I will pass you the comments, Karen Rue, there's lots, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so Lee, Ben, Jody, Audrey, thank you for helping us. And in particular to Thaddeus. My pleasure. And next week we have a uh, very wonderful Gillian Ackerman joining us on November the 5th, Thursday, and she's going to talk about navigating the world of short films and features. So that's not one to be missed. Um, and everyone have a wonderful day. And thank you so much for joining us. Thank Great. You. Thanks, okay. Jean. Stay safe. Hi, you're very welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye, Thaddeus. <laughs>